draw on lessons, in particularly from outside the sector, and to gain new perspectives and insights into the potential of libraries. Uh, I know it sounds sort of quite a lot to do on the last day of our conference, but we are very excited about this session. In this session, we're going to be looking at engaging pillars of our sort of conference sort of theme about engagement, it's really sort of key aspect of our work. And of course, the role of information in economic, social, cultural, and political participation uh, in part and parcel of the field that we're going to be working with. It's why access to information is fundamental to human rights. But meaningful access to information is not just about consumption, uh, and of course uh, libraries do provide that, but arguably it should be more about catalyzing uh, uh, and activating all uh, and mobilizing all our users. And so today, we'll not just be looking at how libraries can build on stronger links with their own users, customers, but also helping them to maximise use of our resources, our space, our collections, our people, but also how to help them make steps from being informed citizens to engaged citizens. Uh, yesterday we had a great session around sort of libraries and the role of sort of democracy and sort of digital sort of literacy, and really this does sort of follow on from that theme. Uh, to do this, we have a great speaker uh, this afternoon, sort of travelled here from the United States, uh, Michael Peter Edson. Um, Michael is a strategist, a consultant, a thought leader at the forefront of digital transformation in the cultural sector, uh, as well as the chair of the European Advisory Board. Uh, he has been director of the web and new media strategy for the Smithsonian Institute and co-founder of the Museum of the United Nations, UN Live, a newly emerging institution designed to catalyze uh, global change sort of fraught, uh, from the bottom off. So without sort of further to do, welcome Michael. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. All right, we're locked and loaded. Um, there are talks where the speaker kind of glides in from his or her home country and delivers the talking points. You know, we say back home, bada bing, bada boom, and goes home again, mic drop. And there are talks where the speaker is wrestling with new ideas in real time based on what they heard and said and thought this morning. This is one of those second kinds of talks. You are now with me participating in the cutting edge of humanities cultural engagement research for climate action. Global scale, rapid speed, bottom up, disruptive, activist, all of that good stuff. So in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk a little bit, we're gonna play, we're gonna work a little bit together, you all, and then I'm gonna try and put some ideas into play that I think will help you, help us, think more clearly about the world we're living in the role that our institutions, our families, our communities want to play in that role, and therefore what actions are necessary for us, even if they may be scary, difficult, or new. Um, and I hope that in this talk, feeling through this together, we can marshal the confidence or a little bit of extra clarity that can help us see through or reach through or break down the typical walls that separate us in our professional work from the things that matter in civilization, and they matter a lot. So, hence a rewritten title at you know, 10.30 this morning, a few hours ago, how millions of bold librarians will help save the world by inventing a unique form, I'm sorry, a unique new form of global activism in response to the climate crisis. Get all that? 
There's method in my madness. Uh, I'm Michael Peter Edson. I may or may not talk a little bit more about myself in a bit. Um, up there on Twitter, the website, I'm a digital cultural strategist. I've worked in museums, culture, libraries for 32 years. Trained as a painter and a printmaker, if I'm trained as anything at all. Um, my first job was at the Smithsonian Institution cleaning plexiglass cases in 1990, $10 a case, wax on, wax off. And like many of my brothers and sisters, many of you in this room who were doing other things when technology got interesting, I started uh, uh, researching and playing with the web and laser discs and CD-ROMs and seeing what it all meant in the context of a place like the Smithsonian Institution, world's largest museum and research complex, 29 museums and research centers and a zoo, 147 million physical objects and a mission to increase and diffuse knowledge to all humankind. Um, that mission was forged in the 1880s when a Mr. James Smithson, the illegitimate son of a British aristocrat, gave his wealth to the United States to found a new institution for this increase and diffusion of knowledge among men. Smithsonian later dropped the among men part. And that wealth arrived in the US Treasury in, I think, 10 cases filled with gold. Congress took a decade to figure out what to do with the money and what on earth the increase and diffusion of knowledge actually meant. They never did come to a decision after a decade of bickering. So they punted the problem down to a newly created board of regents to solve. And I submit to you that the kinds of institutions you work in, the industry you work in, the sector you work in, libraries, information, museums, culture, is still somewhat beholden to those founding ideas of the 19th, 18th, 17th, 16th, 15th century, now in a 21st century world. And we're stuck. And climate, as Mary Robinson so beautifully said at the beginning of this conference in her opening keynote, um, climate is a game changer. And I think climate, the, the dynamics of the climate crisis act like an X-ray or a truth serum on our values, our conduct, and our actions. Um, so here we go, lock in. Um, I've been reading like a, like a wild man. I've been reading all the strategy documents coming from the library sector, preparing for this talk, all the manifestos, um, all the action plans. Uh, this is one I just picked from the ALA's uh, recent climate document. Climate change, bold, ty bold type, First page, climate change is the single greatest threat to global health, a code red for humanity, and this gen generation's grandest challenge. <sighs> you know, those are fighting words. But we've got a problem. The aspiration and the awareness, let's argue that it's there within our sector. This is a photograph I took at a session two days ago about uh, combating disinformation and misinformation in libraries. There were six speakers from six countries, um, a lot of studies, and uh, the moderator asked after the presentations, raise your hand if you think that misinformation and disinformation, fake news, all that is a, is a severe problem in your country. And 200 hands went up. Oh, sorry, yeah, you guys too. You don't have to, I'm telling the story. Um, uh, raise your hand, the moderator told this group, if you think this is a severe problem in your country, and all the hands went up. And the next question, and bless her, I wanna give her a big hug if I can find her. Um, next question was, raise your hand if, basically if you're doing something about it. Oh, it got very, very quiet. And this has been my, my experience. Um, Throughout this conference, throughout the last six, seven, eight, nine years, working on the, the sustainable development goals, working on climate action, working on trying to do work that matters in society with all of these tools we've been given, the resources, the trust, the real estate, the collections, trying to make those do something important and consequential in society. And I have been was thinking about how to mix, thinking about that encounter in that conference room and all the deadly quiet about what are we doing? 
Where does the rubber hit the road? And I was up in the speaker room for the last few days looking out across the canal, the lovely canal that feeds into the river here in, in Dublin, and there's a sign out, you can see from the speaker room window, of this poor forlorn dude standing, the silhouette of this guy standing at the abyss, <laughs> kind of looking at the water. And I started really communing with that guy, we, that person, that human being, um, gender uncertain. And uh, yeah, he kind of takes my breath away. I feel him. And I feel, thinking about Mary Robinson's speech, thinking about the news of the world on fire around us, um, what's that guy thinking? He's us. It me, we say back on the east coast of the US. What's he thinking? Uh, there's another instantiation of this sign a little farther down the canal and someone's graffitied on it. It's like some message from another dimension. Do this, do something. But it's, I can't quite make it out. It's in, a, it's in a script I don't read, but it's haunting me. And then a little further down, oh, it's all gone to hell. The little guy's world is broken. And this, this, I felt pain in my body when I saw this. I'm taking this very seriously. So um, the other interesting thing is just beyond this on the canal, a bunch of kids were swimming. A bunch of kids were joyously diving off the retaining wall. They were all wearing wetsuits, chasing a soccer ball in and out of, the, out of the water, just having a great time. And there looming around them was this, this um, token of existential doom that I was communing with. It's, it's, been, a, it's been an emotional week here in Dublin. Um, so here's this problem space that I'm putting to you. We have all the knowledge, the resources. Somebody said recently 2.5 million libraries globally probably tens or hundreds of millions of librarians, information specialists, and pr pr probably every community on earth. What shall we do? What shall we do? And I found through working on trying to, to solve this equation with all kinds of institutions all over the world, this state of mental turmoil is not conducive to creativity and insight. Like, um, gripping the problem so hard. So sometimes when you get stuck and frustrated, you just gotta, you just gotta play a little bit. You gotta let the juices flow. So I am gonna break the, the fourth wall separating me from you, and I'm gonna ask you to, to play with me for a couple minutes. We're gonna play rock, paper, scissors together. We're gonna have the IFLA closing keynote rock, paper, scissors tournament. And it's gonna get a little busy, and if you're a person who doesn't like noise and activity and interaction, just uh, feel free to stay quiet and not participate. And those of you around them, if you sense someone is uncomfortable with this, just leave them be, that's cool. Uh, it'll just take a few minutes, but here's, here's what's gonna happen. Um, everyone's gonna stand up and turn to someone near you and play rock, paper, scissors. If you don't know the game, we go back home, one, two, three, shoot, rock, Paper, scissors, scissors beats paper because it cuts it, paper beats rock because it wraps it, and rock beats scissors because it breaks it. Whew. Childhood game, known around the world. So, and if you win, stay standing up. If you lose, sit down. If you win, find someone else to compete with. Ready? If you don't know the game, ask a friend to teach you. So, up you go. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> I love the sound, the buzz. Oh, early, early defeated people in the back row. Sorry, it didn't work out for you. And the victorious. <laughs> oh, rock beat scissors. Sorry, Leslie. <laughs> All right, now it's going to start getting transcontinental here. 
We got someone standing down here in the front who needs a, who needs a competitor. Okay, over there. You can do it across the auditorium. Someone said, told me at another conference, it's like, a, it's like casting spells from Harry Potter. All right, there you go, blue suit, down front. There you go, uh, there you go. We got someone still standing, anyone? Way back, are you still a winner? We got a winner in the gold sweater up there. One more to go, wait, yes, gold, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll call it out. One, two, three, shoot. Scissors, rock. Scissors, uh, rock wins. Hey! Well done. Very well done. That was very game. Did you hear that, you know, that sound? Like, what just happened? All of a sudden there was laughter. It's hard not to laugh when you're playing an awkward game unexpectedly with a librarian, right? Um, uh, joy, you know, your heart's going, your, your central nervous, your brain, new parts of your brain are connecting and working. It's a very, um, a very vigorous and very different kind of working and thinking, using your body, becoming involved, um, reaching through boundaries. This rock, paper, scissors game is actually very ancient. Uh, there is a, a Edo period Japanese version. I think it's called um, Huntsman, Fox, and uh, like the mayor of the town is the translation. So this game is, has been played all over the world. You can play this in Fortnite, Battle Royale. This is a little scene I found where these two guys are, I don't know about the bunny suit. Um, two guys are showing up loaded with weapons to fight each other in Fortnite and they put their guns down and they play rock, paper, scissors and just have a great time. Um, you can play rock, paper, scissors in Minecraft, of course, and many do. Um, there's a game show in the Philippines uh, where you play rock, paper, scissors for $10,000 prize. It's totally amped up, uh, dramatic music and lighting and smoke, and, but it's basically rock, paper, rock, paper scissors. <laughs> you know, ah, the victor, the winner. Uh, and and you know, finally, there's a, a great scene with uh, the US TV host, Jimmy Fallon, meeting Sophia, who is a theoretically an AI, an algorithmically generated person personality in a robotic form. And this encounter, I, I encourage you to look for it on, on YouTube, is, is quite extraordinary. It, it makes me think of the first contact we'll have with other species. I mean, maybe this was it. Play comes so naturally, so deeply seated, this kind of conviviality and reaching out and uh, try to stop kids from playing. You can't do it. Uh, you have to teach adults not to. Uh, and Jimmy Fallon is completely unnerved by this encounter, playing a child's game that comes deep from within our brain with this other alternate reality being. So what's the point here? The point is that we know from neuroscience now in the last 10, 15, 20 years that when people play, they think more clearly. They think more clearly about difficult problems that might stick in a typical office, whiteboard, post-it note, ugh world. Uh, if you want to start solving hard problems, teams, uh, teams that play together generate more ideas more quickly than teams that don't. Uh, Atul Gawande was asked by the World Health Organization to, would you please solve the problem of uh, uh, surgical mishaps causing severe harm to patients worldwide in places with no money and no resources. Would you please work on that for us? And he said no at first. He didn't think it could be done and they shamed him into doing it. And what, what he and his team found was the simple act of asking surgical teams to face each other before an operation, say their name and their role, seemed to decrease the instance of uh, surgical accidents by an enormous and significant percentage. I'm gonna misquote the um, the number from, from my memory, but something about the social activation of facing your peers, facing your community, and just communicating with them made the brain work differently on a seemingly intractable problem. So we know this, where I'm headed for this, we know that you can design for play, dialogue, and conviviality. People who shop at a farmer's market have 10 times more social interactions than people who shop at a at a major brand supermarket. We know that this works, but we really haven't applied it yet to difficult 
problems. And I've been in hundreds of, well, I've been in dozens of rooms where we're trying to hear from normal people what they think about the SDGs and these great big problems. And as soon as this, this slide goes up, people, uh, you know, people just, uh, they shut down. They just, they start, yeah. and, it's, and if you say you're from the UN, then it's like, game's over. Like mom and dad's in the room, the authorities in the room, people lean back, just defer to the authority of the UN. Same thing for a museum. Um, I'll tell you a story later about that. But you know, if you say I'm from the museum, people's brains just break there on the spot. But if you approach it a different way, if you approach these challenges in a different way through play and conviviality and creativity, dialogue, you get very different kinds of answers. So now that I've warmed you up, now that you've warmed each other up with play, I want to do another little exercise here. These are the sustainable development goals, familiar 17 goals, 169 actionable, achievable steps that we're supposed to make significant progress on by 2030, which is less than eight years away now. Um, although we really don't know how, <laughs> it's a big problem. So what I want you to do in this little exercise is find, a, find someone, twos or threes, find someone you, you vanquished in rock, paper, scissors. And I want you to look at this list and I want you to pick one of these, not that you think is the best sustainable development goal, but the one that you have a personal story about in your own life. And I want you to tell each other that little personal story. And it doesn't have to be perfect. God, if there's one thing that drives me nuts about my, you, my brothers and sisters in this library museum world is we just want to analyze the heck out of everything. We're, we're addicted to that kind of left brain analysis. Let it go. Doesn't have to be perfect, but pick a story and then tell your neighbor that story. I'll give you like two minutes, three minutes to do that. Go ahead. I just noticed you all up in the cheap sheets, cheap seats. Hey, everybody. How's the view from up there? Solid. OK, one more minute. But if you insist, I'll give you an extension. And thank you, nimble camera people, for catching a curveball. That's a beautiful sound, isn't it? I love that sound. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to listen for a sort of an ebbing away of the, 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 that beautiful bubbly human sound. And I have to say I've missed this in the age of COVID. It's wonderful to be in a room like this and hear that sound. It's magic. Okay, wrap it up. And thanks online 
audience, too, for uh, being a part of this. OK. So that was pretty cool. One thing I've learned through, I don't know, the last 10 years of, of doing this. Well, one thing is I just decided when I was working on the UN Museum project um, that any time we had the opportunity to gather people together, we were going to play some, we were going to work some, and we were going to share some ideas. Uh, so you know, two out of three already done. Well done. Does anyone want to share one of their, one of the, their stories, something they connect to on this? Please, come up to the mic. And I'm assuming that nimble AV tech can handle this. Last talk of the conference. Can you hear? Oh, yes, you can. Yeah. Um, so I am a librarian. I'm from Sydney, Australia. And during lockdown last year, even though it was completely out of my comfort zone, this is so important to me that I did a graduate diploma in planetary health. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're getting a big up. So what is, what is, is there a story about this, that this planetary health that means something to you personally? Uh, yes, because my council that I work for has just secured a piece of land that used to be a golf course and they're going to turn it into a centre for planetary health. I didn't know what that meant. I want to be able to go out to the community and talk to them about it knowledgeably. And now I can because I've done a course and the course was very practical and uh, spoke about grassroots engagement. So I do feel a lot more comfortable now talking about planetary health to the community. Oh, please find me afterwards and tell me all about okay. planetary health. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? Ah, one. Yeah. Way back. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, it's, it's, it, it doesn't have to do with, uh, with my, my job, actually, but it's uh, about... Uh, um, goal 14 about life below water. Uh, when you go swimming in 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 the Mediterranean Sea, uh, you can see that more and more plastic bags are floating around in in the water. And uh, when I go swimming, actually, I just grab the plastic bags and I try to bring them back to the shore. Uh, of course, I can only see the big ones, uh, but I'm you know I'm very concerned that uh, there are many many smaller you know, plastic uh, bla bags or, or, or debris or that uh, you can't see. And I'm wondering whether we'll be able to swim in the water, in the sea, uh, in, you know, in 20 years or, or maybe five years. I don't know. That's a, a great concern. Thank you. Yeah. And if there's one more, I'll take it. Otherwise, I'll move on. Sure, feel free to share them with me and each other on the social media or just find us in the hall. Um, but OK, thank you. Um, so there's a bit of a, clearly a bit of a method to this madness. Um, first of all, I've broken the traditional boundaries of conference keynotes, right? We don't do this. And yet, so easy. So fun. The other is we know that in changing people's minds, changing behavior, I'll get to a little later, it's not about the information. There's a strong emotional component to it, a contextual component to it, a participatory component to it. We know that people uh, won't change and, and, and won't uh, understand complex new ideas unless they see them in their own lives, make sense in their own context. And the, uh, the, the, the last thing in this moment is, um, having to speak with someone, having to make a choice about all the things you think and feel in order to communicate with another person, making a choice, making a commitment accelerates learning and growth. We can all sit back and tread water and think about these lofty, difficult ideas all day long, but as soon as you decide as an individual or a work group or a museum or an institution to make a choice and say something in public, it's a completely different game. So, here we go. Change and action have familiar and knowable patterns and f familiar obstacles. Um, I often use this 
image in uh, conference work, in consulting, working with boards of directors, and I'm looking for Gael, my colleague with the Europeana Advisory Board. We used this recently. Um, this is from the great Kathy Sierra, a social media pioneer. Uh, and she says that in every organization, every group, there's this big frickin' wall. And frickin', sorry translators, I, don't, I wouldn't know. Frickin' is a American idiom, let's say darn, or gosh darn. Difficult wall. Uh, and most of us are working happily down in the lower left of this diagram. This is where we are. And on the way other side of that wall is where we need to be, the work we need to be doing. And working in our safe, traditional, incremental, habitual ways, we can get up to that wall, but no farther. Slow, incremental work is great, sustains us in a lot of ways but you can never get over through or around that wall. And I think this, from, from being at this conference today, uh, this last few days, hearing this, the conversations about climate action, hearing Mary Robinson's call for us to be a thousand times, 10 times, a thousand percent more effective and impactful and action-oriented in our work as a sector towards humanity's probably last crisis. I hope not. Um, we are so clearly on this side of the big frickin' wall that it screams at me. Me and that, that silhouette guy in the canal are talking to each other about that frickin' wall in my dreams, my nightmares. Um, but that wall can be, can be dealt with. First step is to see it there and to use this diagram in your teams and your conversations with your colleagues, families, to help talk about what you're doing and what you're not doing. So big frickin' wall. Another, um, ha. Great quote from a George Mambayat article in The Guardian. I think this was 2018. Yeah, uh, I'm going to read it to you about this big freaking wall, the disconnect between those on the other side of the wall and us on this side of the wall. Uh, he writes, a young woman called uh, Lizia Wolf stepped forward. She hadn't spoken before, but the passion, grief, and fury of her response was utterly compelling. What is it you are asking me as a 20-year-old to face and accept about my future and my life? This is an emergency. We are facing extinction. When you ask questions like that, and the question was something like, why don't you just use, why don't you just vote? When you ask questions like that, what is it you want me to feel? We had no answer. And then Monbayat editorializes, Softer aims might be politically realistic, but they are physically unrealistic. Only shifts commensurate with the scale of our existential crisis have any prospect of averting them. Hopeless realism on this side of the wall, tinkering at the edges of the problem on this side of the wall, have gotten us into this mess. It will not get us out. Another tool lens that I think I use a lot, I think you can use, to have better conversations with your teams about what you're committing to and what you're not committing to, is this uh, civic engagement matrix from the great Ethan Zuckerman, formerly of MIT Media Lab, and um, uh, uh, oh, I'm, I'm having a, a mind meltdown, but magnificent guy. Um, and uh, he created this this matrix is a way to have conversations about civic action and engagement outside the traditional channels of politics, voting. And the way this works is up, down, thin engagement, and thick engagement. Thin engagement's really easy for you and me. Thick is hard, group work, effort, you know, just a lot of labor. And left, right, x-axis. On the left, symbolic outcomes and on the other side, impactful outcomes. And these are, you can quibble about the words. It's not a worldview, it's a tool for thinking, tool for having better conversations. And so you can, up in the top left, thin and symbolic, Ethan Zuckerman would say, that's thumbs upping fighting climate change on Facebook. Like, great, you thumbs up that. Um, scales, phenomenally, to hundreds of millions of people, has no actual change goal behind it. Um, is very valuable, thin engagement can be very valuable if it's aligned with a strategic path that takes you to deeper and more consequential action. But there, on the other side, so to its right, thin and impactful, he, he says, think about voting. 
in most places in the world, my own country, we're not so sure at the moment, voting's easy. Voting's designed to be thin. Show up, cast your vote, you do it. It can be tremendously impactful because it has infrastructure behind it. Voting has the commitment of an entire society, a government, armies, education systems, tax systems, monetary systems, uh, library systems. So thin actions can become impactful with good designs and with careful orchestration. And that's, I, I won't get into the bottom of this quadrant so far. I'm mostly interested in this kind of symbolic to, to, to impactful axis. And the idea that with good design and thoughtful orchestration, thoughtful convening, you can get to better, more impactful action. And any project you can think of, if I think of the, the XYZ Confederation of Library Organizations manifesto, almost all of them that I've read, solidly symbolic and thin. And actually ask anything, they're not part of an architecture of change, they have no commitment, there's no line of accountability, it's symbolic and thin. So you could sit back and you could look at yourselves and go, huh, that's interesting. I've got me a, a thin and symbolic gesture that my team just spent 10 months writing with 500 of my members and, you know, what could we do? Let's play with that for a bit. What could we do to make that commitment impactful over time? Remember, Mary Robinson, I need you to be a thousand percent more impactful now, not next year, now. So tools you can use. Um, these patterns of, of change making are very mysterious to us in these professions. I kind of I kind of got hooked through trying to make change at and with the Smithsonian and with the UN system and the SDGs on the trying to understand the architecture of change. And I'm still a neophyte, still a grasshopper, neophyte student, learning, working hard. But patterns are beginning to emerge. One of them is you look for leverage points. This is an outstanding essay, new to me. Um, leverage points, places to intervene in a system by uh, systems designer uh, Donella Meadows. It is stunning if you're interested, if you're geeking out on how to get from symbolic to impactful. She posits nine very impactful places in a system that you can intervene, you can take your manifesto into, change the information flows. Well, that sounds like something librarians ought to be able to do. Change the information flows. What's an example of that? Favoring certain kinds of books and publications in your uh, recent acquisitions list. Changing the participants, changing who you invite. Um, I'll get into some specific examples. Changing the rules of the system. Get into examples of that. The distri distribution of power over rules of the system. Who gets to say what is dangerous and reactionary from a museum and who doesn't? Changing those rules could be a very powerful pathway to having greater impact through libraries in climate. Um, goals of the system, mindset or paradigm out of which the system emerges, and that's the most impactful place, and that's, I think, within our grasp as well. Let me unpack this a little bit. Um, Internet Archive, after the pandemic, created the National Emergency Library. Um, what do they call it? It's sort of uh, temporary digital loans. They have the physical book. They made a scan of it. They decided to lend the scan of it, regardless of who had the copyright, to one person at a time for an hour anywhere in the world for free after the pandemic hit because people couldn't get information. And they believe, like you believe, that information is the fuel of a d d democratic citizenry and is also necessary to start forming the actions needed to respond to a global crisis like the pandemic, like climate action. So they just did it. They changed the rules around the information flows. Seems like heresy. Probably not something that a lot of your institutions would consider doing, but you could, and they did. Uh, another changing the rules of engagement around who has information and who shares it, the wonderful Conflict Kitchen in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, Conflict Kitchen is, serves, I think, every two weeks. They serve the cuisine native to a local immigrant, migrant, refugee community. And then every lunchtime or a couple of times a week, they have a, kind of a teach-in, a meeting about 
refugee, immigrant, migrant life, displaced person's life in that community while you're eating the food. Super simple, not a government, edu not formal education, not coming out of a library, convivial, face-to-face, -face, the kind of sharing you've done today, totally changing the rules and changing the information flow. Very gentle. You could do that, too. Um, I've noticed in a lot of these patterns, when I watch people in organizations who are creating and moving vigorously towards more and more impactful actions, a lot of us get stuck working through false, what I call false dichotomies. So uh, what kind of messages do we want to send? Are hopeful messages? Are hopeful messages more impactful talking with people about climate? Or are negative, urgent messages? You know, we're going to die, or everything is great, let's go. Well, in fact, these are false dichotomies. A lot of research has shown that everyone needs a different kind of emotional message at each different point that they're on in their own learning journey with climate action. At certain points, you need hope. At certain points, you need urgency. At certain points, you need to um, respect someone's need to grieve and be in pain. Another great uh, false dichotomy is, uh, should we go top down or bottom up? You know, let things emerge from the crowd or sort of dictate. Those two things can be designed for together. And successful teams aren't, don't spend a year wrestling with that idea. They make a decision. They try and design for both, both together, young and old, designing for young and old, global local, one of my favorites, fast, slow. Don't let these kinds of ideas, successful teams creating high impact around climate action in their communities, work with these dichotomies as parts of a whole. And you can too. Um, another place I think we in the library sector have heard and tried to be attuned to, we are really have a blind spot about scale. We're saying libraries, I've heard, paraphrasing, making a straw man, fair, fairly or unfairly, uh, librarians are going to help create the kind of information access and community action that helps communities be more resilient and survive in the climate crisis. Library systems, budgets, impacts are like this big compared to the scale and scope of industry being committed to green transformation. Uh, Europe, the European Green Deal, has $1.8 trillion on the table over the next five years for green transformation. If we think we're going to combat misinformation in libraries, we're this big Steve Bannon and Infowars and state apparatus, apparati, dedicated to disinformation are this big. Um, we need to reckon with that in our calculation of what kind of levers of change we can push on and what kind of partners we need. In a session yesterday on collections and climate action, uh, people were asking questions about where, where's the impact, where's the hours, who's doing this? Scouts, the International Organization of Scouts a few years ago pledged a billion hours of effort towards the sustainable development goals. They got by 2022, I think almost two, 1.7 billion hours of effort, 16 million scouts, like I'm going to miss the number, 30 million different projects and participants. And they decided, well, that was cool. Let's double that by 2025. We're going to dedicate 4 billion hours of effort. So that's interesting to me in a couple of ways. Uh, the effort in, in and of itself isn't going to change the climate crisis, but it's a strong indicator that something very powerful is happening that can be improved and built upon. The other thing that fascinated me about this, and I think it, dif it distinguishes, there's a distinction between what scouts did and what Library XYZ Manifesto is doing, where they made a commitment. I mean, a tangible, visible commitment, like your commitment to play rock, paper, scissors, or stand up and talk to a neighbor. They made a commitment, and then they marshaled the resources and improvisation to make it happen and succeeded beyond their initial guess. And I've seen that happen again and again and again. Freaking scouts. Oh, and by the way, uh, UK scouts last year, 2021, created a new badge for misinformation, disinformation. So it's smack right in the middle of our problem space of solving this problem. So let's go make some friends with some scouts. Um,
Another great example of changing the information flows and changing the rules of conduct is a newspaper in Germany, as newspaper people do, was worried about the deteriorating debate uh, around um, politics in Germany around the world. A lot of disinformation, a lot of anger, polarization. So they created a program where they invited uh, anyone in Germany to register to have a conversation with someone whose views they would disagree with. And they had everyone, to 12,000 Germans registered and listed their views. And the newspaper, pardon me, wrote an algorithm to match people within 20 miles of each other who disagreed with each other the most. Very cool computer science problem. And uh, 6,000 of those people, I believe, took up the, the agreement. And of that, I think 600, so 1,200 people actually had the conversation. They followed up with data. They found that the most positive progress, the most positive impact, impactful, symbolic, impactful, the most positive impact came from people who met who actually had the most divergent views. Very interesting. A lot of librarians say, oh, we want to catalyze conversations in our community. Totally doable. Um, and we know, we know, neuroscience tells us that just providing people with more information doesn't change their minds. Uh, for the UN Museum, we did some research on the social science of behavior change in cultural engagement regarding climate action, and we found a lot of research that said, you know, we've probably seen it, the more you tell someone, the more information you give them, if it disagrees with their worldview, they're more certain they're right. And sometimes giving people information somehow cognitively alleviates them of feeling like they're responsible for taking action. There's a really interesting uh, experiment with Norwegian fishermen where the more they knew about uh, ecosystem collapse in the North Sea, the less they actually felt they needed to do something about it. So there's an emotional component to all of this, a missing link in our model of librarianship that is exposed by the facts of the climate crisis. Information to learning to knowledge is a very biased and myopic way of changing the world. We're going to need to grow and expand some. Um, this graph on the right is from, I think it's a hashtag climate in action stripes. That is CO2 level and temperature rise from 1900 to the present. And the little tick marks above the line are uh, global compacts to take action on climate change. Like if that doesn't hurt you, I don't know what does. We know the facts. The picture on the right is from Scientist Rebellion. Scientist Rebellion has been getting a lot of news recently, scientists saying, we're done writing IPCC reports. You know the science, you know the facts. What we need now is action. What we need now is action. And they're willing to engage in a very carefully designed campaign of civil disobedience to do it. Um, Another pattern you can draw from is tactical urbanism, a wonderful way of sort of hacking short-term interventions at a city scale aligned with strategies. You maybe have seen a wonderful um, uh, parking day is uh, started in San Francisco where people went and fed parking meters, coins, and rolled out grass and brought lawn chairs and record players and espresso machines and kind of did a pop-up park for a day. And when the neighborhood sees how fun that is, City planners start to get involved and get interesting, and sure enough, those parks have hardened into, uh, those pop-ups have hardened into permanent parks. My point here is if you can do it at the scale of a city, you know how hard it is to change City Hall. You can do it at the scale of a neighborhood or in a library very easily. Uh, Mike Lydon is the guy for tactical urbanism. Um, another hack that to inspire you, uh, back in the early aughts, the city of Melbourne, do you know this story from, from oh, you're from Sydney? Um, decided to give every tree in the city an email address so that they could keep track of broken limbs. And, uh, and what they found was that people started writing love letters to the trees, like thousands and thousands and thousands of letters to trees. They changed, they created a brand new information flow that nobody knew was there that met a currently completely invisible need for people to commune with the nature around them. I mean, holy cow, some of the, the poems are, Dear Rose Gum, over the past year I have cycled by you each day and want you to know how much joy you give me. No matter the weather or what is happening around you, you are strong, elegant, and beautiful. 
I wanted you to know. <laughs> Love. Um, creative mornings, another wonderful example. Um, AIDS memorial quilt, changing the information flow, changing the way information about the AIDS crisis is presented emotionally and viscerally. I'm not saying every library scientist needs to go out and create a quilt for climate action, but if your ambition is high enough, if you're striving and having productive conversations about moving your efforts from symbolic to impactful, you will naturally find people doing this kind of work and they'll find you. And it's a beautiful, joyous thing when it happens. Um, I, we had a, an interesting moment uh, at one of the sessions earlier in the week when I brought up from the audience, brought up the idea of activism. Do you need to be activists? Do you need to be activists organization? Do you even know what activism is? And everybody in the room <gasps> sort of recoiled um, that was a, uh, that word created an immune system response in the audience. Uh, it's not a word that's typically associated with librarianship, but I will argue to you that you're already there. You've already been activists. You have, we have, you, we, we have a particular bias about what information is, about what information is trustworthy, about what it points to, and about what the boundaries of our professional conduct are. It's a very activist idea in regard to the climate crisis. It's the idea that has led us to this crisis that we're in. Informed, educated, library-friendly people like you and me have created this existential crisis for Earth. So we're already activists just in a comfortable, familiar pattern. And I think it's really only a very, think about Think about Robert Smithson creating the Smithsonian Institution in the early 1800s with 10 crates of gold. That world does not exist anymore. This world we're living in now really, really exists in a super sharp way and is only gonna get more and more challenging. So I think the stretch, what I'm, what I'm implying to you, my brothers and sisters, is that this small step left or right to activism is just a natural extension, an expression of our values in a world that's very different than the one we were trained in. Um, if you want an example of what a good activist strategy looks like, Google uh, Project 3.5 from Extinction Rebellion. These two brilliant young people sit down and explain the strategy. The strategy is to get 3.5% of the British population involved personally in participating in climate protests. And there's a lot of research that says that if you get 3.5% of a population involved in protest, it changes political systems. So that's their goal. Their tactics are have local meetings, listen, don't talk much, three days before the meetings, knock door to door, introduce yourself, listen to what people have to say about the idea, invite them to come, follow up with them, give them something specific they can do at the meeting, and then follow up with them afterwards. Like, ah, nothing scary about that. Like, we could do that. We could do that. Um, and if the whole idea of being out in public and taking risks makes you feel uncomfortable, there's, I was trained, this, this is important, this is an epiphany the last few days, I was trained, raised to think that here is being passive and voting. It's responsible citizenship. That's what my library taught me. And right next to it is violent protest and burning things in the street and throwing bricks through shop windows. And there's really, it's one or the other. And my wife and I, through these last weird years in America, have said, what's it going to take to get people throwing bricks through shop windows? Like, that's what needs to happen, because being passive isn't working. What I'm learning through listening to all of you is that there's, you sort of explode that presumed adjacency, and there's an incredible richness of possible action and activity and vitality and rock, paper, scissor playing that's at our disposal to learn about, but we're just not trained in it yet. One of those things, if you don't like getting out in public and going to marches, you can become a craftivist. This is a wonderful book about knitting and being quiet. Um, join us in the art of gentle protest. That sounds like something a lot of the librarians that I know would gladly do, and there's a wonderful book on my messy desk at home, um, How to Be a Craftivist, The Art of Gentle protest. There's so much possible to do. The problem space is huge. If you want to learn more about all of this, and, and I'm sort of 
bring in the airplane down for landing here. Um, if you want to learn more about all of this, find a thread and start pulling on it. And there's just a wealth of beautiful writing, beautiful thinking, inspiring information written by people like you and me about how this works in their lives. The uh, Penguin Books has a Penguin Green Ideas series, 24 little books of essays. Uh, Greta Thunberg's is the first one um, about how, what this moment in the world means. Educate yourself. And then the next one, and then the next one. Um, I want to recommend a couple of my own talks, some of my own work about the dynamics of taking action. Uh, Think big, start small, move fast is a good one. These are on SlideShare, easy to find. These slides will be available through the IFLA site. Don't have to write anything. And then Dark Matter, which describes the way that many of us see the world where the civic participation and cultural action and learning that happens outside the walls of traditional institutions is so much bigger, like the dark matter of the universe, it's 97% of what there is. And if we want to be a part of the world, if we want to respond to, to, uh, um, to the call to action, we just need to look away from our institutions for a minute and make friends with the people already doing the work all around us. Um, a, another couple of great books that have helped me assemble the puzzle here a little bit. Blueprint for Revolution, Ruined by Design. If you're wondering what your role is as an individual, do I leave, do I quit, do I, do I become a saboteur? Um, Mike Montero's book, Ruined by Design, is really great. By the way, if you buy that book through Amazon, I think the Amazon copy comes with instructions on it for how Amazon workers can join the local union. So as the book goes through Amazon's distribution system, it's like an ad for, for bringing Amazon down. It's just like, right? So, um, so finally, how this, how this talk works. Um, this is very carefully and intentionally constructed this way. Uh, who? You know, these mission statements, these visions, they have an architecture. They have a lame architecture if you don't want to do anything, and they have a different architecture if you do want to do something. I want to do something. So first, who? Millions of bold librarians. What kind of librarians? Bold. What is this about? This is about how we do something. Will help save the world. What are they going to do? They're going to help save the world. What are they going to do? They're going to invent a unique new form of global activism. I don't think that we're capable of adopting scientist rebellion tactics throwing bricks through shop windows, um, nonviolent protests, those things are hard for us. But I think the future demands that we create our own new, unique form of global activism in response to the climate crisis. That's what it's about. It's in response to the climate crisis. And this is kind of a breakthrough for me. It's not going to be teaching you guys how to be scientist rebellion or the civil rights movement. It's about deciding for ourselves to find a brand of activism that's harmonious with our values, our training, our conduct, our customs, but is also assertive and focused and outcome-oriented and accountable in a way that generally we've just never had to be before. Um, there's so much more to talk about, but I've gotten excited uh, and talked too long. If you want to know more about some of the specific projects that you can be a part of, that I'm helping to bootstrap, go to climatethings.org. We're orchestrating a $10 million challenge prize to the first cultural team that generates 10 million hours of community effort towards the SDGs. And then a reboot of the beautiful 23 Things program that many of you will know called 23 Climate Things. And you can learn about both of those and you can help make them real for free right now. And with that being enough said, I saw this quote at the March for Science a few years ago that I'll close with from Marie Curie. Nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. Like, that's us, right? This is a little scary, it's a little hard, but we can be good at doing hard things. Thanks for listening.
Right, uh, thank you, uh, Michael, for that. That was a um, great, so inspiring, so engaging and participative. That was really so good there. Um, I'm sure that the audience may have some questions. I'm just conscious, because this is a live stream, we might have to stop the live streaming now. And I think there's another um, group that need to be in here. So maybe rather than perhaps do question and answers now, if Michael, you're around sort of after this sort of session now, if anybody has got a sort of question, uh, maybe you could sort of uh, ask it sort of on a one to sort of one uh, basis here. Thank you so much. And another big round of applause for that was absolutely great.